hello, coming online now, and uh, give a few minutes for folks to gather. Glad you can be with us tonight on this Sunday night on Mother's Day, and uh, just welcoming any and all who are able to join us tonight. Um, I'm going to ask Patty to uh, share for just a moment while people are coming online and uh, open us up with prayer. So uh, here's uh, the mother of my children. Hi, happy Mother's Day to all of you moms out there. I was so blessed today by my kids. It was just wonderful. But you know, as I started thinking about it, I know that some of you don't feel as blessed today and it hadn't been as happy a day. Some of the kids forgot to call, or they were too busy, or maybe they just don't like you. But there are a lot of reasons that you may not feel honored or blessed today. But after all, you should, because you gave them life. You birthed them. And I want to just honor you and thank you for always choosing life, choosing to have these children. But you know, I remembered also today that there's somebody else that gave us life, that gave us eternal life. And sometimes we get too busy to think about him. And sometimes we're too busy to praise him. And I just want to help you and help all of us tonight to remember that that's what it's about, is to remember him and what he did because he's the one who gave us life and so I want to ask you to focus on him tonight and let's pray Father we want to honor you we want to thank you for giving us life you're the one that's given us eternal life and so as we go to the word tonight as Mike brings the word let us remember who it is that made it possible for us to hear the word and to rejoice and we give you praise and thanksgiving in jesus name amen amen well i'm uh, going to be tonight in the book of daniel so i want to encourage you i really hope you're bringing your bible to this time and that you're bringing a notebook and uh, taking the time to take notes and go back and review these things because uh, I know I'm covering a lot of material, and I've got a lot on my mind and heart, but I want to always be sensitive to our time, so I'm going to try and stay to a, a specific uh, set of ideas tonight. But the message tonight I wanted to bring, I'm calling it an everlasting kingdom. Uh, but what I want to focus on for just a few minutes tonight is I want to focus on a word that's familiar to us, but it's the word Babylon. I want to talk a little bit about Babylon and what it is, what it represents. Now, I'm not going to be the guy that's going to sit down and explain to you, you know, here's where the, this is going to happen and that's going to happen and here's the details and the exact person and all these things. I, I've never really been the person to focus on those kinds of uh, details about end times and things like that. I'm much more interested in understanding the principles of God's Word because those principles are universal, and they're universal to every generation, and they are instructive to us, and they actually help us live our Christian lives. So, although it's impossible for, I think, any of us to look at the circumstances that are going on in the world right now and not see significant prophetic uh, purpose to those things, I want to focus on some of the principles of uh, Scripture in regards to this. And when you think about the word Babylon, you know, the word Babylon comes from the word Babel, the Tower of Babel. And the Tower of Babel was man's first attempt uh, to rise up against God and establish his uh, perspective as a civilization, as a total humanity, the total human race, speaking one language. The Tower of Babel was man in a sense, and an affront to God saying, we're going to build this tower and it's going to go all the way up into heaven. So the, the picture of Babel is a picture of all of the human race speaking one language, coming together with one purpose, which is to exalt themselves 
and their civilization and their culture and their activities against God. And then the, the nation of Babylon became a picture of, biblically, a symbol of that same idea. It's not that different from what we see when the scripture describes the heart of Satan when he was rebelling against God in heaven. He said, I will ascend to the Most High. I, I will set my throne above the throne of God. It's a picture of that willfulness, that uh, haughty spirit, that kind of arrogant heart that says, we don't need God. We can do this on our own. It's the same thing that happened in the Garden of Eden when Satan uh, tempted Adam and Eve to say, you don't need God. He's just got his thumb on you. He's trying to hold you back. All of these things really flow together from the Garden of Eden and the fall of man to the Tower of Babel uh, as the, all of the human race was speaking one language. Matter of fact, the Bible says God divided the human race by language at that point in order to keep man from being able to cooperate in rebellion. That's the reason why the Bible says that he confounded the languages of the earth. And then we come to this picture of Babylon, the nation, and again, a picture of in scripture the the nation of or the the mentality of or the ideas of man against god the haughtiness of man against god now with all that in mind i want you to look with me at daniel chapter 4 because in daniel chapter 4 there's something that happens uh, in scripture that to me is symbolic of something that i really feel like is happening right now and what happens is not what I want to call the fall of Babylon. That is going to happen. We're going to talk about that in just a moment, the fall of Babylon. But what I'm talking about tonight to begin with is this picture of the rebuke of Babylon. We know, we know in verse, they're telling me the volume may be down. I'm going to do my best to turn it up. They tell me that, the, that we know in the book of Revelation that the Bible says Babylon has fallen. And the ultimate fall of the Babylonian system, the system of man against God, of man without God, what the Greek word calls cosmos, which is the, the whole of the government and the constitution and the mentality and the values and the priorities, of a world system without God. All of that is going to fall one day. But there's a symbol of it here in this book of Daniel. And I want you to look at Daniel chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon at this point. And he starts out by saying in verse 1, To all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I thought it was good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. How great are his signs, and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. Now this is Nebuchadnezzar, who is the king of Babylon, saying this. Now why would he say that? Why would the king of Babylon talk about the greatness of the signs of God, talk about the mightiness of his wonders, talk about his kingdom being an everlasting kingdom, Talk about his dominion being from generation to generation. Why would the king of Babylon make such a bold proclamation about the kingdom of God? Well, there's a reason why. And the reason is because Babylon experienced, Nebuchadnezzar experienced a rebuke. The rebuke of Babylon preceded the fall of Babylon. And we see that where Nebuchadnezzar goes on. I'm not going to read all these verses, but Nebuchadnezzar around verse 4, he, he was at rest, the Bible says, in his house and flourishing in his palace. Now think about this as a symbol of the world system. And then he had a dream, and the dream made him afraid. And so he issued a decree to get all of his magicians to come and all these people to come and tell him what he had dreamed. We know this story. Uh, but the visions that he had, the, the people were not able to give the interpretation. And so here's what he saw, and I want you to see this. He said, I was looking, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, this is in verse 10, 
The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens, and it could be seen to the ends of all the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, the birds of the heavens dwelt in its branches. And look what it says in verse 12. And all flesh, all flesh was fed from it. Now it's interesting because in the few verses before, we see that Nebuchadnezzar called Daniel, whose, whose name was Belshazzar, that's what Nebuchadnezzar called him, but his name was Daniel. He called Daniel because he says in verse 9, I know the spirit of the holy God is in you and no secret troubles you. So explain to me the visions of my dream that I've seen in its interpretation. Then he tells him, here's what I saw. I saw this tree. It was in the midst of the earth. Its height was great. It was, it was growing. It was strong. Its height reached to the heavens. It could be seen to all this. He tells all these pictures. And then he says in verse 13, I saw in the visions of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, chop down the tree, cut off its branches, strip off its leaves, and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts get out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and root in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven. Let him graze with the beasts on the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him be given the heart of a beast and let seven times pass over him. This decision is by the decree of the watchers and the sentence uh, by the word of the holy ones. And then he says, here's why. In order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he will and sets over it the lowest of men. Now, here's what I want you to see, is that Nebuchadnezzar begins in chapter 4 giving praise to God. Now he begins to explain the story as to why he's glorifying God and he's giving praise to the kingdom of God, and it's because Nebuchadnezzar experienced a rebuke from God. And in this rebuke, it started as a dream, as a revelation. God was wanting to communicate to Babylon, to the world system, to the king of Babylon. He was wanting to communicate a warning to the world. And he did that by giving him a dream. Nebuchadnezzar had the dream. He saw this beautiful tree. Then he saw this tree cut down, and he saw it stripped down, and its fruit taken away. And he saw it bound and restrained. And so he called upon Daniel to say, what is this? Explain this to me. What does it mean? Well, when Daniel comes, he says to him, King, I wish this wasn't about what I'm about to tell you. I wish it was about your enemies, but it's not. He says, here's what you need to know. Verse 20, the tree you saw which grew and became strong. And he, he tells all the story. He says, this, this tree, verse 22, it's you, King. You've grown and you've become strong. Your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens, your dominion to the end of the earth. And then you saw a watcher or a holy one, an angel coming down from heaven, chopping down the tree, uh, destroying it, but leaving its stump with roots bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. And he said, this is what's going to happen to you, king. He says, they're going to drive you from men in verse 25. You'll be with the, dwell with the beasts of the field. They're going to make you eat grass like oxen. They're going to wet you with the dew of heaven. Seven times shall pass over you until, there's an until here, there's a purpose, there's a reason, until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. And inasmuch as they gave the command to leave the stump and the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you after, after you come to know that heaven rules. Now, he, now Daniel rebukes and warns Nebuchadnezzar. He says, Therefore, king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. And perhaps... 
there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar, a symbol, if you will, of the world system, was given, first of all, a warning. And then, after this warning, he was given a rebuke, a correction. And he was given it by the people of God and the Word of God. And it was the purpose of it was to let Babylon know its days were numbered and it was coming to an end but that God would allow things to continue for a while longer if Babylon would hear this rebuke. And as I was praying about this, the Holy Spirit started speaking to me about the times that are going on, and I really felt the Holy Spirit saying to me, Mike, this is not the fall of Babylon yet, but this is the rebuke of Babylon. I'm rebuking the priorities of the world system, I'm rebuking the systems of the world system. I'm rebuking the values of the world system. I'm rebuking the institutions, the government, the constitution, the, the, uh, the works of the world. I am rebuking it. I am warning the world that its days are numbered, that its time is coming to a close. And I am, I am I'm telling the world, you need to recognize what is true, what is eternal, what matters. You need to get the values reordered because Babylon, this system, is coming to an end. There's coming a day when Babylon is going to be overthrown, when Babylon is going to fall. Later on, there's a dream that is talked about where there was a statue that was seen and the head was gold and the shoulders and the and the uh, the chest were made of silver and then the belly was of bronze and then the legs were of iron and the feet were of iron and clay and then in this dream there came a stone and the stone came and knocked this huge statue down and as a result it was it was basically crushed in, into powder and then the wind came and blew it away and then the rock began to grow until it filled the whole of the earth and when the interpretation of that dream was given to the king, he said, you are the head of gold, Nebuchadnezzar. But after you, there's coming silver and then bronze and then there's coming uh, brass and then, uh, and then iron and then clay. And he said, and, and then this other kingdom is coming. And in this kingdom comes, it's going to knock all these other kingdoms out. And then it's going to grow until it fills the whole of the earth. And this he was speaking about, the kingdom of God, a rock that was not cut out by men's hands. But here is an attempt of God to speak to the systems of the world and to grant to the systems of the world an opportunity to repent, an opportunity to turn, an opportunity to break off their sins by being righteous, their iniquities by showing mercy, so that there might be a lengthening, a lengthening of their prosperity before the end of when the Babylonian system will, will fall completely. So this was the warning to Babylon. Here's what I feel like is going on right now. This is a great warning to every nation, tribe, kindred, and tongue. Going all the way back to Babel, when all of the nations had one language, then God divided the nations by language in order to, to keep them from cooperating, to rebel against God. Now there's come upon the whole of the earth, every nation, every tribe, every kindred, every tongue. There's come upon the entire world system, our econo economic systems, our military systems, our political systems, our, our, our uh, systems of, of social interaction, all of our systems now. There has come upon us a, a rebuke, a rebuke and an exposure. Now, I wish I could tell you that Nebuchadnezzar's reaction to the warning that came by the Word of God and the warning that came uh, by, by the dream, that he saw this and he responded to it with repentance and a change of heart, but he didn't. I want you to notice what happened in verse 28 of Daniel 4. All of this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking around the royal palace of Babylon. And then the king spoke, saying, Is not this 
great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty. But while the world word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, now think about this. He's the symbol of the world system. He said, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. And they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you. Seven is a picture of completion. And when it pass over you until, this word until is something we've been talking about. How long does God plow? He plows until the ground is ready. We keep hearing this word, this concept of until. How, how long does the plague last? It lasts until we consider the plague of our own heart. This word until, he says, I'm going to drive you from men, make your dwelling with the beasts of the field, they shall make you eat grass, and seven times shall pass over you until, until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. And at that very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men. He ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. And at the end of the time, the, the time until, he says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven. When he lifted his eyes to heaven, his understanding returned. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, What have you done? And he goes on to praise God. He ends by saying, at that same time, my reason returned to me, for the glory of my kingdom, my honor, my splendor returned to me, my counselors, my nobles, they resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added to me. But he says, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice, and those who walk in pride he is able to put down. Now, here is the point. I believe this is a great rebuke of the world system. It's a great rebuke of Babylon. It's a great rebuke of the cosmos, the, the, what, the Greek word for the world system and its ways. But this rebuke, is, it, it may come as a warning, it may come as a dream, it may come as the Word of God is preached, but I want you to notice that that did not accomplish the change of heart that Nebuchadnezzar needed. It wasn't until Nebuchadnezzar pridefully expressed that the whole world was his, it was all built by his hand, it was all built for his glory, it was all built for his splendor, it was all about him and what he wanted and his pride. Then, suddenly there was a tremendous shaking of this king of Babylon who represented the world system. And notice what happens. This, this king, the Bible says, his tree was chopped down. It says that the branches were cut off. It says that the leaves were stripped. It says that the, the fruit was scattered. It says that the creation that had gathered, the birds of the air and the beasts of the field that had gathered under the Babylonian system were scattered now. And then it says that there was a, there was a, a binding put on the tree of iron and brass to restrain the tree from growing anymore. It's a picture to me of the Lord rebuking the world system, taking its loveliness. Remember it said his leaves were lovely. Its fruit. What is the fruit of the flesh? You know, the fruit of the flesh, the scripture talks about it. It talks about, you know, uh, idolatry and hatred and division and strife and lewdness and sorcery and, uh, and you know, pride and arrogance and all of these things. All of that fruit, he says, was, was restrained and stripped and the fruit was removed. This is a time right now that there's a rebuke of the Babylonian system that's taking place. Now here's the thing that I feel. 
I feel that God is wanting to say to the church, get Babylon out of your heart. Get the Babylonian value system. Get the Babylonian priorities. Get the Babylonian perspectives. Get those out of your heart. Because this Babylonian system, the system of the world without God, is, is going to fall. Right now, it's being rebuked and it's being exposed. Where, where Nebuchadnezzar looked so strong, he was growing, he was this mighty tree, he was full of fruit, his leaves were beautiful, everything looked wonderful. Now suddenly, it was stripped bare. Everything was, was, was held back. There was restraint against the growing of this Babylonian system. And it was a revelation of how fragile, again, how empty, how hollow uh, this system really is. And Nebuchadnezzar, who thought everything was about him, suddenly discovered that everything could be gone in a moment. And this man who was eating the delicacies in his, in his field was now eating grass on his knees. This man who had slept in the beautiful palaces was now sleeping and the dew of the field was falling on him. He was sleeping on the ground. And all this was happening for purpose. The purpose was to shake Nebuchadnezzar's perspective. To shake to the core his perspective of who he was versus who God was. That's what this rebuke was intended to do. Because God wanted Babylon to be shaken. He wanted their pride to be shaken, their haughtiness to be shaken, their exalted opinion of their perpetual prosperity and, and all of the things that they thought they had accomplished through their own works and their own values. He wanted that all to be shaken to its core. And he did whatever it took to get Nebuchadnezzar to the point that his perspective and his view of himself was made small and his view of God was enlarged. And he did this in a powerful way. He started with a warning in a dream. He continued to a specific word of God. He then turned that to a call to repentance, but Nebuchadnezzar didn't listen to any of that. But then came a shaking. And when his pride was brought low and all that he had boasted of was suddenly taken from him and everything was shaken, it changed his view of himself and it changed his view of God. Now let me say this. This is something that should have already been a reality in the heart of the church. The church should already have such an exalted view of the Lord and such a small view of man that we don't adore, we don't idolize, we don't cater to, we don't curry the favor of the world because we know the world for what it is. We see it as such a fragile system. But I, 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 I think that the reality is, prior to this season that we're in, the truth is that the church has been enamored of the world. I really believe this. I just want to say this as a pastor for 40 years. I really think we saw the church as being small. And we saw the world as being large. We saw the world as having the really good stuff. And the church as kind of having secondary. We saw the world as having the stuff that everybody celebrates and idolizes and yearns for. And the world as being kind of, you know, pushed to the side and considered insignificant. All those kind of things. But see, here's what's happening. This Babylonian system is being shaken. And as it's being shaken, regardless of what it appears on the surface, I'm going to tell you, in the hearts of men all over planet Earth, there's a great shaking going on in their minds and in their hearts if they have been invested in this Babylonian system, if they've been living for this Babylonian system, if they've been completely uh, you know, connected to this Babylonian system, the world system. They're being shaken to the core. And their view of Babylon and what it could produce and what it can do and its stability and its permanence has been shaken. And, and now they're beginning 
their hearts are being prepared to begin to lift their eyes to heaven. It says that when Nebuchadnezzar, verse 34, lifted his eyes to heaven, his understanding returned to him. When he lifted his eyes to heaven, when he stopped looking at money, he stopped looking at entertainment, at sports, at politics, at, at, at advancement, at, you know, at personal uh, ambitions. When he, when he stopped looking at all of that and he lifted his eyes to heaven, that's when his reason started returning to him. His understanding started returning to him. And that's when he was prepared, he was ready to start to hear about God. It didn't happen through the warning that came in a dream that made him afraid, but it didn't change his heart. It didn't come through the Word of God preached to him, which the Word of God's been preached in the earth, but that alone didn't do it. It didn't come even when he got a face-to-face -face rebuke from the prophet. Even then, Nebuchadnezzar's pride was still in place. But when he exalted himself one step too high, and suddenly the, the supports were knocked out from underneath him, and suddenly those that beautiful tree was cut down, suddenly those magnificent uh, limbs were chopped off, suddenly those lovely leaves it talks about were stripped away, suddenly the fruit began to fall to the ground, and the world start, started leaving Babylon and started looking somewhere else for answers. That's happening in people's homes. It's happening in people's hearts right now. When this happened, there was a change. And the main change that happened for, for Babylon was that they, their view of themselves began to diminish. And their view of God began to increase. Now here's the thing I believe. I believe that this is a rebuke. And because Nebuchadnezzar began to see and his understanding started to open up a little bit and he began to lift up his eyes a bit beyond his own system to something higher than himself, the result was that Babylon continued for a while longer, but not much longer. It was only a short time that Nebuchadnezzar continued to serve because then Nebuchadnezzar was replaced by Belshazzar. And Belshazzar is when Babylon fell. Because when the next king came, the Bible says he didn't listen to anything that Nebuchadnezzar had taught him. He didn't change in any way. And it says in chapter 5, verse 18, Daniel's now speaking to Belshazzar. He says, O king, the Most High gave Nebuchadnezzar your father a kingdom and majesty, glory and honor. And because of the majesty he gave him, all the peoples and nations and language trembled and feared before him. But he says in verse 21, but when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. And then he was driven away. And it says in verse 21, until he knew the most high God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints it over whomever he chooses. But you, his son, Belshazzar, you've not humbled your heart, although you knew all this. And you've lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven and you've brought out the vessels of the Lord's house and you've brought them to your wives and your concubines. You've gotten drunk from them. You've worshipped and praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron. And he says, and so here's what you need to know. Your kingdom is about to be taken from you and it's going to be divided to the Medes and the Persians and, and it's over. Babylon is over. Now here's the picture that I see. There came, after the rebuke of Babylon, there came the fall, the overthrow of Babylon. But before Babylon was overthrown, God rebuked Babylon and he gave a lengthier period of time under Nebuchadnezzar for the work of God to continue until the pride of man had gotten to the point that Babylon was no longer going to be allowed to exist. I believe we're in a season of the rebuke of Babylon. And I believe this season is meant to, within the church, 
For the church, which should, as I said before, we should have already got a clear picture of the Babylonian system and its, its fragile nature and the fact that it's not what we want to build our lives on. But I, I suspect many of us, if we're really deep down on us, we would watch TV, we'd see celebrities, we'd see sports and athletic stars, we'd see people with wealth that accomplished great things, millionaires and billionaires and people who have, who have you know, built great systems and great companies and all kinds of things. And we would look at that system and we would say, gosh, that's really where the, that's the golden system. What we have is kind of the clay, you know, we, we're kind of the, the off cast, we're the, we're the, the side story. What I pray is happening in your heart is that you're beginning to see that we're not the side story, but the church is the centerpiece of history. The church is what history is all leading to. And the systems of this world, in a moment of time, Nebuchadnezzar, in one hour, went from boasting over the beauty of his glory and his kingdoms and his palaces and his wealth and all that he had to eating grass and sleeping on the ground. The world has gone in a very brief period of time from the glory and the splendor and the activity and the wealth and all those things boasting really at times of our economies and of our systems and of the things that we've built. And now suddenly we're all shut down. The leaves are stripped, the fruit is gone, and there's a band right now of iron and brass around the stump of Babylon. Here's where we, I think, can begin to find that between now, what I would call the rebuke of Babylon, and the days that are coming when the Babylon system falls that Revelation speaks of, between then and now, we have the opportunity to step out of this rebuke season and speak into the Babylonian system has, which has been shaken and prepared by God, I believe, powerfully prepared by God to hear about an everlasting kingdom, a kingdom that cannot be shaken, a kingdom that's king will rule through all eternity, the rock it's going to knock down the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron, and the clay of all the kingdoms of this world and is going to become the solid, everlasting kingdom that will rule forever and ever. There's going to be a great opportunity, even if people appear on the outside, to be disinterested to begin with. I'm going to tell you their hearts have been shaken by these events. And their hearts, there's a greater potential that they would begin to look to heaven and their understanding would come to them at this time than perhaps any other time. You know, it's interesting that there's a, t a passage of Scripture in Hezekiah, in, in the Old Testament about Hezekiah. It's found over in Second Chronicles. And I want to kind of end with this because to me it speaks to the church and I want to pull, a, pull this together. But in Second Chronicles chapter 31, there's a chapter 32. There's a verse of scripture that speaks about Hezekiah, and it says in verse 31, however, regarding the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, whom they sent to him to inquire about the wonder that was done in the land, God withdrew from him. God withdrew from Hezekiah in order to test him that he might know all that was in his heart. You see, Hezekiah had been sick, then he had been healed. The king of, of Babylon had heard about it and sent princes down to find out about this miracle that had happened. And the Bible says, when the princes of Babylon came to sing King Hezekiah, the king of Judah, the Bible says that God withdrew from Hezekiah for a moment. He pulled back when the princes of Babylon came near to the, to the people of God. And he did it to see what was in their heart, to test them and see what was in their heart about Babylon. Now, if you go over to 2 Kings, and I'm almost done, 
Look at 2 Kings in chapter 20. We see in verse 12, 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 12, at that time, Baradoc Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah. For he heard Hezekiah had been sick. And Hezekiah, the Bible says, was attentive to them. And he showed them all the house of his treasures, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious ointment, all of his armory, all that was found among his treasures. There was nothing in his house or in all of his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and said, Why did these men come and where did they come to you from? Hezekiah said they came from a far country, from Babylon. And he said, So what have they seen in your house? And Hezekiah answered, They've seen all that was in my house. There's nothing among my treasures I have not shown them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried away to Babylon. Nothing shall be left. And they'll take away your sons whom you'll beget, and they'll be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. In other words, when the princes of Babylon came, to find out why did they come. They came because Hezekiah had been sick and God had healed him and they had heard about it in Babylon. And they came to see Hezekiah to hear about the wonder that had been done. Had been done. The Bible says, so God stepped back from Hezekiah for a moment to see what Hezekiah would do. Here is the world coming to the church and the world is coming to the church to hear about what has happened and notice what Hezekiah did Hezekiah didn't take them to the house of the Lord he took them into his own house he didn't speak about the healing of God he spoke about his treasures his silver his gold his precious ointment his armory he showed them all of the treasures of his house but he didn't show them God's house he didn't talk to them about the power of God, the healing of God, about the, the glory of God. And as a result, the Bible says that he opened the door eventually for what was going to become the Babylonian captivity that would happen many years later. Now, let me conclude with this thought. I know I've shared a lot and I've gone a little over tonight, but I believe right now We've talked about this in all of these, I don't know if you can call them the car chronicles or something. We've talked about how God is working in the church right now, but he's also working in the world. In the world, he's shaking what the world has trusted in. But in the church, he's supposed to be awakening us to what we always trusted in. That we would not be having to wake up at the same time the world wakes up to the failing systems of Babylon, we wouldn't have to be experiencing a rebuke. We would be the Daniels in Babylon. We would be the ones who refused to bow our knee to the statues of Nebuchadnezzar. The ones who refused to deny the Lord even if we're thrown into a fiery furnace. The ones who refused to eat the delicacies of the king's table. We're supposed to be the ones who go right into the presence of the king of Babylon. The highest rulers, the most important people, the celebrities and the power players and all the people that we think the world thinks is so. We're supposed to be the ones who can go right to them and say, you need to turn. You need to lift your eyes to heaven. You need to, to, to turn from your iniquities and from your sins. You need to prepare your heart to meet God. You see, Daniel was in Babylon, but Babylon was not in Daniel. And Babel, which became Babylon, started out being in the world, but now I have to tell you, the entire of the world is in Babylon. So as the people of God during this season, prepare your heart to come out of this season where the world is being rebuked and the Babylonian system is being shaken, come out of this time. Please, my, my, my saints of God, don't go back into a system 
of being enamored by the values, the priorities, the perspectives of this world. Use this season between the rebuke of Babylon and the fall of Babylon, which is coming, to speak like Daniel into the heart of the Babylonian captives and tell them, turn your heart to God. Stop building your life on sin. I'm not enamored of your position, of your power, of your wealth, of your celebrity. I'm no longer captivated by that. I'm captivated by God. My understanding has returned to me. And it's Him who alone deserves the glory. So this is the thing that I feel the Lord is wanting to say. The rebuke of Babylon will be followed as it was from Nebuchadnezzar to Belshazzar by the fall of Babylon. It may be that the Lord will allow a season yet of prosperity, of protection, though binding back the Babylonian system from its full expression to give the church an opportunity to speak one more time into this world that's fallen. I pray in my heart that I'll be ready and able to do that. I pray that there'll be no person, no matter how many times they've been on TV, it doesn't matter if they're the most celebrated person on planet Earth, that if I get a chance to look them in the eye, I want to say to them, have you learned something from what's taken place? Have you understood how fragile this world is? It's time to look to heaven and get your understanding going because the pride of this world has fallen. The Bible says pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. The Bible says God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Don't believe what your eyes show you. When this season is over, you're going to have opportunities you've never had in your life. And the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you with great power if you're giving the chance to to talk to people that you thought would never have expressed any interest in things of God and begin to speak to them. I want to close in prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you're teaching us the difference between the kingdom that is everlasting and the kingdoms that are falling. Your scripture tells us clearly and plainly in Revelation that the kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. It doesn't matter if they're gold or silver or bronze or iron or clay. They're all going to fall. And the systems of this world have to fall to be replaced. Lord, let us not lament the fall of those systems or the rebuke of those systems or the shaking of those systems which have to ultimately be cut back before the world will begin to look to heaven and will begin to have understanding. Lord, I praise you that in the midst of this, Daniel was well fed. Daniel was taken care of. Daniel served four kings of Babylon, from Cyrus to, to uh, Nebuchadnezzar to Belshazzar. He served all of these kings, and he remained while they came and went. Lord, the church is going to stand and be a rock and be protected, I believe that, as they stand as a light to the nations. Get us ready, Lord, for this reopening that's going to take place, for whatever time frame there is between the rebuke of Babylon and the fall of Babylon. Help us to be Daniels in this generation, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Much love to you all. And happy Mother's Day to the moms that are out there. Uh, and thank you for joining us on these Sunday nights. Again, I'm, I'm just going week by week seeking the Lord. And I'll continue to uh, keep you informed as the Holy Spirit guides me. God bless you. And uh, have a wonderful evening. Good night.